Welcome, everyone. Before we begin, I just want to acknowledge uh, that we're meeting on the land here, anyway, where I am, of the Baramata Gull people of the Darug Nation. Uh, this land was never ceded. Uh, I want to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and uh, also to pay respect to any First Nations comrades who are here with us tonight. Uh, my name's Susan Price. I'm one of the co-editors of Green Left. Uh, Green Left is a radical media project uh, here in Australia. Um, for those of you not familiar with it, um, greenleft.org.au is our website. Uh, I'll be chairing the meeting tonight and I want to welcome you to this forum, which is co-hosted by Green Left and the Socialist Alliance um, as part of the Eco-Socialism 2022 event. Well, Russia launched its illegal invasion of Ukraine on February 24, which is almost exactly eight months ago. Um, and the war has raged on, uh, bringing death, destruction and displacement to the people of Ukraine and uh, the loss of countless Ukrainian and Russian lives, Russian soldiers' lives. The war uh, and the causes and possible solutions um, to end it have been topics for much debate uh, and discussion on the left and in progressive anti-war circles. And tonight, we hope to continue that discussion by hearing firsthand uh, from a Ukrainian democratic socialist activist and also from a leader of Socialist Alliance here in Australia. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Denis Pilash. Um, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Denis. Please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, Dennis is a political scientist and activist involved in social movement in Ukraine and is on the editorial board of the left journal Commons, which explores and analyzes Ukraine's economy, politics, history and culture. And uh, social movement have just had their uh, conference, um, which uh, Dennis will probably make some comments about. Uh, following Dennis, we're going to hear from Sam Wainwright. Uh, Sam is one of the co-conveners of Socialist Alliance here. Um, he lives in Fremantle. He's a former City of Fremantle councillor and a long-time Labor and environmental activist and contributor also to Green Left. So we're, we're very pleased uh, to have Dennis with us, especially given that you're uh, hearing air raid sirens even now as we're starting this um, this panel, um, but also very happy, Sam, that you could be with us tonight too. So without further delay, uh, I'll hand over to you, Dennis. We look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me, and I hope that um, electricity and internet say, will be stable. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm uh, Denis Pilas from uh, Ukraine, originally from Transcarpathia, now I'm in Kiev. And um, well, I started as an activist in a student union called Direct Action and a group called Organization of Marxists. And now um, I am a member of, as you mentioned, the social movement, um, the socialist organization called Sociální Ruch in Ukrainian. And uh, Commons Journal, Commons also has its English version, so you can um, take a glimpse on our analysis of the situation in Ukraine and abroad a bit of. Uh, and um, actually, we are now in, um, uh, in the midst of the, one of the worst tragedies in the history of this country and in the history of Eastern Europe in general, uh, possibly since um, the end of the Second World War. So since the Nazi invasion uh, of the Soviet Union, uh, this land hasn't seen this uh, magnitude of uh, devastation and terror that was brought by uh, Putin's right-wing authoritarian regime by his uh, unilateral um, decision to uh, aggressively invade Ukraine. And this has already led to uh, devastation of um, entire cities and towns. So you have uh, many places in Eastern and Southern Ukraine, Izum, uh, Rubizhne, uh, Mariupol, um, that have been uh, destroyed almost completely. And you have also uh, many places, even in the 
uh, areas of Kiev and Kharkiv where the, the war has been successful for, for the Ukrainian side and uh, Ukrainians could repel the aggressors, but still it left over um, those uh, numerous, uh, countless uh, bodies of civilians who have been killed in places like Irpin, Bucha, Izum, and so on. So uh, what, what was primary for uh, the people of Ukraine to withstand in this aggression that is in no way uh, um, it's a, an imperialist aggression, aggression of the Russian imperialist per se, that is not, not any kind of, uh, you know, dialectical negation of Western imperialism, but it's direct continuation. Actually, Putin goes in the footsteps of uh, George W. Bush and all other uh, warmongers, what they've done in Iraq, it's now uh, repeated and in some places in uh, maybe even in worst intensity here in Ukraine now uh, with uh, constant um, uh, shellings of uh, the cities in the south and in the east uh, with um, uh, targeting civilian infrastructure and civilian housing. And actually here in Kiev uh, for these weeks we had, um, they were hell out of these weeks because uh, the city has been targeted by uh, hundreds of, of uh, missiles and drones that were operated by the, the Russian military. Uh, so how, how still uh, the people managed to um, you know, persist in this uh, nightmare? It's uh, mostly due to this uh, very spontaneous and uh, very solidary resistance that emerged in the, from the first um, minutes of this invasion, when we see uh, the first weeks uh, of, of uh, uh, Russia's uh, army uh, entering Ukrainian soil and um, killing uh, local population, uh, was met with uh, all types of resistance. This means not just uh, people who were uh, resisting with uh, weapons in their hands, but also people who were protesting uh, in the occupied regions until these uh, protests have been suppressed because first months there were uh, huge uh, rallies in, in Kherson, in uh, Militopol and in other uh, occupied cities uh, with people with their bare hands uh, standing against Russian military vehicles and Russian armed soldiers. And uh, this involved people from all, all types of milieus uh, Ukrainian speaking, Russian speaking, people from other ethnic communities. But we also speak about those people whose uh, uh, work in um, uh, behind the, the, the front lines was very essential. And from the first days, we had uh, millions of people who were involved in the humanitarian effort to rescue and assist their um, other people from the uh, war torn areas and from more dangerous areas. And uh, uh, we cannot uh, forget the, uh, the effort that was put by the um, workers of the state railway company who uh, actually managed to uh, save uh, millions of lives because they uh, transported uh, millions of people to safer places inside Ukraine. The, the war has resulted in uh, millions of people who have left Ukraine and become refugees in uh, mostly in the European countries, but also uh, even bigger number of people who had to relocate inside Ukraine, who were fleeing occupation and fleeing the war. And you had uh, people who were helping them on, uh, on the ground. You had uh, numerous um, uh, networks of solidarity that uh, were created in a very spontaneous way. And you had also the uh, sacrifice of uh, many pe people in healthcare sector or uh, firefighters. And you can continue the list, the people who were uh, risking with their lives uh, to uh, protect others and also to just keep the, 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 the country uh, going, to keep the uh, essential services to be in place. And even now when Russia is targeting uh, power plants, power grids, uh, destroying uh, entire objects. Uh, people, almost immediately you have the workers who uh, restore uh, these uh, energy connections and who 
uh, work their best not to have uh, the rest of the country to be frozen to death in, in the coming winter. So uh, again, uh, this is um, something that involved um, countless number of people. And uh, these people, the working class people of Ukraine, um, they uh, have been at the same time, while they are targeted by, uh, by Russian imperialism that is very clear in, in its uh, intentions to erase any kind of you know, Ukraine is a separate entity, Ukraine is a separate republic, with Putin blaming uh, Lenin and the Bolsheviks for establishing Ukraine as a separate Soviet republic and blaming uh, that they uh, then uh, disconnected this Russian, uh, great Russian chauvinist imperial legacy. And so, so he's restoring the old empire and uh, assimilating uh, those who, who have been... Um, subjugated and uh, this applies both to this um, uh, occupied regions where they had some referendums that were uh, you, uh, you you cannot even ex uh, explain how uh, how cynical it was to uh, to claim that they have like 90 percent over 90 percent of people uh, uh, who voted for for, for uh, annexation of Russia, because actually there was no no real voting. There were just some uh, armed people who were coming from, from door to door. And uh, also there were some invented results when you have, in, in for instance, in the Parisia region, you have uh, uh, maybe a third of population under the occupation and a third of them have uh, fled the region. And uh, again, then they claim that uh, they're made up uh, so-called results, uh, they give uh, Russia the right to annex the entire region together with, uh, with the cities of Parisia that hasn't been occupied and so on. So uh, again, uh, this is very clear where, where it goes and it's very clear uh, how brutal the, the regime that is installed on, uh, on these occupied regions. Uh, but uh, at the same time, the, the working class here is also targeted the same essential workers who are so um, who are at the core of this resistance. They are targeted by the neoliberal policies of the, our own ruling class. So uh, you could see how disaster capitalism works in, in uh, Ukrainian conditions as well. Because the, the ruling class and some of the more, most neoliberal MPs some people in the ministries, they grab this opportunity to uh, push through their shock doctrine of uh, neoliberal austerity, of anti-worker uh, legislation, of curtailing uh, social and labor rights. And um, they have been um, successful in pushing through a couple of uh, laws that uh, now make the life of uh, employees much, much Course and uh, the possibility to sack them much easier. And they also are um, now planning to uh, go further with uh, um, full-scale uh, labor law that will um, replace the existing legislation that still uh, has uh, many provisions that can be used to protect uh, labor rights and is quite, quite good, actually. Uh, so uh, this is the situation of this double challenge that is now um, that people in Ukraine are facing. And this is what uh, uh, the organizations on the left operate in. So um, again, from the, the, from the beginning of this uh, uh, full-scale invasion, the majority of uh, leftist, uh, trade unionist, uh, feminist activists, uh, socialists and anarchists, um, they joined in a way or another different types of um, this humanitarian and war effort. Some went to the uh, ranks of the um, territorial defense units that are incorporated inside the, the military. And there were even some anti-authoritarian anarchist groups uh, that could create their own units there. And we have also comrades who uh, who are um, in the military, and you have lots of lots of unionists uh, who who were volunteered or uh, drafted to to the Ukrainian army. 
Um, and also you had people who created um, these networks like the um, uh, collectives, uh, uh, solidarity collectives, um, again, mainly by anarchists who are providing uh, help for, for those comrades who are now in the, um, in the armed resistance, but also for members of the unions and uh, other comrades in need. And you had also many people who were doing uh, also everyday humanitarian uh, work to uh, provide uh, housing, to provide food, to provide uh, any kind of assistance to uh, those who had to replace, uh, mostly in the western part of, of, of Ukraine. Um, and uh, in places like Krivirich, that is uh, one of the uh, working class hearts of Ukraine, it's an industrial city, um, with uh, different ore mining uh, facilities. Um, and it's uh, not so far from the front line and it has hosted uh, a big number of people who fled from uh, Kherson and uh, Mykolaiv regions in the south. And there the unions, they also work as a non-stop um, humanitarian aid uh, organizations at in fact, in this, in this stage and many of our comrades there as well. Uh, but also we need to uh, remember about the uh, political work in, 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 in these times. And uh, actually uh, what our organization, social movement was doing from the beginning, uh, together with all this uh, other humanitarian voluntary stuff and so on, uh, was that we were, um, First of all, trying to bring our um, political demands and uh, uh, the demands that uh, reflect the, the needs of, of, of Ukrainian population in times of war. And uh, as we think they correspond with a more broad global agenda for a fairer, uh, for a more fair and um, egalitarian world, um, to have this on both national and international level. So we were speaking with um, uh, international comrades and many of them were uh, providing different type of, uh, of help um, and solidarity um, about these uh, demands like the, uh, how not just to, um, to provide what is necessary here and now to, 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 to the resistance, both armed and non-armed, so we welcome any kind of, of, uh, of support for, uh, for the people of Ukraine. But also what we need uh, in a more far-fledged perspective, what we need to uh, rebuild the country, not in the way it was, uh, it is run now, that is run by the, this peripheral oligarchy capitalist model that all Ukrainian governments, notwithstanding with the name of the president and his geopolitical orientation, they were adhering to, um, to uh, maintaining this type of um, uh, capitalist relations and uh, having the core oligarchy uh, uh, like untouched. Uh, but uh, how do we need how we need these um, transformations to a kind of uh, democratic socialist alternative? And again, the country and its economy, it uh, wouldn't be um, uh, active both in war times and after the war in the post-war reconstruction if it's done on these neoliberal uh, capitalist principles that are now embraced fully by. Uh, so-called experts uh, in here in Ukraine as well, um, because uh, first of all, uh, we were promoting such uh, demands as um, the cancellation of Ukrainian debt, and this is the issue that is common for Ukraine as a peripheral country in Europe, and for many uh, countries of the global south. This is actually uh, again the problem of this uh, vicious circle of debt, where international financial institutions keep the um, peoples of, of the uh, uh, entire entire regions and um, um, this this was really freaking out our uh, own, own ministry of finance it was like we we cannot it, it it can it can harm our reputation for the investors and so on 
uh, but actually many uh, leftist parties throughout the world and uh, have adopted this demand and uh, they also uh, see that if we can manage to do this with Ukraine, we can also promote this as a template for, for other countries. Then we have the issue of uh, whether the reconstruction will be done on those neoliber neoliberal lines that were uh, drafted in Lugano, or we will have um, more, um, like more socially oriented uh, uh, gender and uh, ecologically just uh, construction of Ukraine. Whether it will be done in the interests of a handful of uh, developers and uh, um, national and uh, transnational uh, capitalists, or it will be done to uh, benefit the majority of the people. Whether it will uh, uh, really um, include uh, all all uh, all the demands for uh, protecting um, decent labor and uh, for uh, creating uh, a renewable and sustainable um, economy. Uh, and again, this is very connected with uh, uh, the general issue. For instance, when we speak about um, this pressure that should be put uh, on the um, uh, on Russia as on any other aggressor in, in, in these types of, uh, of wars. Um, and uh, again, speaking about embargo against Russian fossil fuels, this should be not just a pretext to switch to another kind of murderous uh, uh, petro-state dictatorship that wages its own wars, uh, criminal wars like Saudi Arabia and Yemen. This should be done in the framework of a broader uh, green transition and this should be really uh, uh, some launching point for uh, moving away from this fossil fuel model of capitalism. Uh, but uh, again, it, this needs international solidarity and international action. And as for, for our own fights with, with our ruling class uh, against its antisocial policies. So we uh, launched a project called uh, Labor Defense that uh, includes both um, we, we are doing legal uh, and other types of uh, help for those uh, workers whose rights have been uh, uh, broken by the employers in, in the times of war, uh, including those who use these uh, new neoliberal uh, laws. Uh, and also we try to raise the awareness of the general population and also of the unions, because the unions, they did a um, good uh, good job to to help uh, people and their members, but they still uh, were weren't so active in opposing uh, um, in doing what unions are enlisted to do to oppose uh, the anti labor steps. And again, it, to bring uh, some more international pressure to um, uh, manifest for the uh, Ukrainian ruling class that uh, they they shouldn't do this. So um, this is a lot of challenges that we are facing now. And uh, hopefully this was a bit of a mess. Oh, sorry for, uh, for maybe it wasn't so structured, but I hope that you'll uh, put some questions that I will, uh, may specify on uh, more uh, specific issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, it's great to hear from you and we'll look forward to the questions and answers um, in after Sam's presentation. So uh, I'll hand over now to uh, Sam Wainwright. Over to you, Sam. Uh, thanks very much, Susan, and uh, greetings to everybody. Um, I'm speaking to you from Fremantle or Walyala, uh, land of the Wajak Noongar people here in Western Australia. Um, and yeah, I want to say a big thank you to, to Dennis for his, his presentation. Um, it's a bit of a personal aside, but um, my partner, Janet, she can't be watching this uh, presentation because she's still at work. It's still only um, five to four in the, um, in the, in the, in the afternoon here in, um, here, here in Western Australia. But her, her mum was born in a small town called Rennie um, in the Bujak region of um, Odessa. Oblast, and uh, we were planning to visit <laughs> uh, sometime soon, but uh, we don't know when that will happen. But uh, ho ho hopefully, we'll get the uh, the opportunity. Look, the first thing I wanted to say on behalf of Socialist Alliance to, to you, Dennis, is that we know that uh, in the context of this brutal war, the activists in social movement face very difficult circumstances. Um, the destruction of human lives and material infrastructure happening around you is very hard for us to imagine and we give deeper sympathy to all of you who have lost comrades friends and family um, as a result of the war 
Um, we know that you have to throw yourselves into the defence of Ukraine against a brutal and senseless invasion, while also resisting uh, attempts by your government to use the war as an excuse to attack working people's rights and democratic space. Uh, so they, they're circumstances that most of us find very hard to imagine. Um, and I'm sure I speak for all of Socialist Alliance when I say we extend our, our solidarity to you. Well, back to the, both the war, um, the invasion of Ukraine and this question of imperialism more generally um, and how the world is organized, uh, which, which, which this poses for us. Now, I, I have to confession to, to make, I wrote an article for Green Left the very day before the invasion happened in February, in which I dismissed as a propaganda beat up by the United States, the possibility that there really would be an invasion. Uh, unfortunately, I completely underestimated to what extent the Putin leadership was prepared to use force to advance its interests uh, and the interests of Russian capitalism as, as it perceives it. Uh, so needless to say, I, I wish I hadn't been proven wrong. Uh, now, us in Socialist Alliance, we don't set ourselves the task of being the experts on the social and political situation in Ukraine or Russia. But the invasions have had profound consequences for world and domestic politics that, of course, we have had to grapple with um, if we had to chart a way forward in politics in this country uh, and in the world more generally. The most immediate consequence for us flows from the fact that Australia is completely embedded in what you might call the Anglo-imperialist axis. Uh, that includes the UK and the USA. And our rulers have seized on the golden propaganda opportunity provided by Putin to promote increased military expenditure in general uh, and to prepare us for the possibility of military confrontation with China. Uh, this, of course, would be a complete disaster for working people in our region and the whole world, uh, and one potentially even worse than the disaster already unfolding in Ukraine. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that. So what approach have we taken in Socialist Alliance in trying to analyse the Russian invasion itself? I'll only touch on this briefly, but I think it's important. Uh, beyond opposing the invasion, we've sought to steer a path between what I would call two extremes or two wrong positions. And the first of these is to simply fall in behind the liberal narrative dominant in our media, that the war is pitting virtuous Western democracy against autocracy and, tyr and tyranny. Um, that's not to say, of course, that uh, Putin is not autocratic and tyrannical. While unequivocally condemning the Russian invasion, uh, at the same time, we can't concede anything to Western imperialism, particularly as socialists uh, within Western imperialism. As socialists in the heart of the Western imperialist beast, we have to remind people that our relative privilege, both material and democratic freedoms, come at the cost of people in the global south on whom war is in inflicted every day of the week. The second mistake, of course, is to reduce the conflict. And this is you know, a very live debate on that's been happening on the left in Australia and the West more generally. The second mistake is, re is to reduce or characterize the conflict as nothing more than a proxy war between the West and Russia and to dismiss Ukraine as nothing more than a pawn of the West and to treat the, the, the wishes of the Ukrainian people themselves as secondary or irrelevant to all that. I think there are very few people on the left in Australia or the West that actively support Russia, but there is a tendency among some to effectively frame uh, a Russian victory as a lesser evil to a Russian defeat. It's sort of born of a notion that Western imperialism and the US in particular, uh, that our desire that Western imperialism and the US in particular should get a blood nose um, is more important than anything else. And that I would say is a fool's anti-imperialism. Neither the crimes of US imperialism, the US's own objectives, uh, strategic objectives of blocking Russia and China economically and militarily or its own meddling in Ukraine uh, changes should, should change that assessment, in my opinion. So based on that understanding, in Socialist Alliance, we've adopted a policy in the war that says, well, it says a number of things, but there's two I'll dwell on. And um, obviously welcome Dennis's comment on these things where he agrees, disagrees, or, or has, has, has emphasis that he wants to expand upon. The, the, the first is that we say that the Ukrainian people have a right to resist the invasion, to expel Russian armed forces from Ukrainian territory and to access the arms needed to achieve this. Secondly, we also say that we support a return to diplomacy to de-escalate the situation and resolve the current impasse if, if possible. 
And we, we further say this is not a call for Ukraine to capitulate, but rather a demand that both Russia and the Western powers abandon their war aims and allow Ukraine to live in peace. Now, some, some people say that it's a contradiction to support both the right of Ukraine to resist the invasion and to support negotiations, negotiations to end the war. Uh, but I disagree, or put another way, um, I agree, but it's a necessary contradiction for the following reasons. If, if, if there's a possibility of Ukra Ukraine securing a just peace through negotiations, or at the very least, a peace that is better than the current hell it is going through, and one that Ukrainian society is prepared to accept in the circumstances, then of course that's something we should support. But it doesn't mean that we should demand that Ukraine sue for peace at any price, that is to say, by simply capitulating to all of Russia's demands, which I think has been um, the way some, on, some, some leftists in the West have, have approached this question. Obviously, unless one side or the other scores a decisive military victory, the war will end, or at the very least pause, through negotiations and Ukraine will be is in a stronger bargaining position precisely for having so successfully resisted the invasion and it was useful to hear from Dennis uh, about how Ukraine you know the the response of Ukrainian ordinary Ukrainian people to the to the invasion fundamentally it's not Ukraine that we want to make concessions um, in negotiations in order to secure peace but 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 Russia and Western imperialism what do I mean by that well the Russian concession is fairly obvious withdrawing from the territory occupied since it, since it launched the invasion. For, for the West, that might include restarting negotiations about a new treaty or treaties regarding the stationing of nuclear missiles in Europe and lifting the sanctions. Of course, we understand that what we want is not necessarily how things will play out and that any such process will be determined both by the balance of forces on the battlefield uh, and by the fact that the West, if, if the West does decide to cut a deal with Russia behind the back of, U, of Ukraine, it will probably be much more inclined to concede Ukrainian territory uh, than to um, de demands of Russia. But I just, I just say that because I think for us uh, here on the other side of the world, it's a mistake for us to trap ourselves into insisting as some sort of moral principle that Ukraine should sue for peace at any price um, or to insist on complete military victory at any price. That's, a, that's something that's, uh, that there's a whole bunch of other considerations that need to be taken into account to, when, when arriving at what is, is the, the, the Ukrainian people are going to have to consider in, in, in arriving at what is going to be the best course forward. Well, back to the, this question of the consequences for us. Um, as I said, it's, it's the drumbeat about the war with China. Uh, we're, we're being told not only to expect it, um, uh, not, not, not just to prepare it, but to, to, to expect war with China. Um, our, 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 our rulers and media are beating war drums um, to, to prepare us for that. Um, even if China doesn't strike first, uh, we're told that we're drifting to war anyway, which is which is, is genuinely very frightening. The, the US is, uh, seemed absolutely determined to stop the growth of China's influence uh, and its further economic development by force if necessary, uh, with UK and Australia in tow. Uh, and as I mentioned at the outset, it seized on the invasion of Ukraine to galvanize support for military uh, escalation. However, this has been their intention for some time now. Uh, an important point, turning point was the Barack Obama's 2009 East Asia strategy or pivot to Asia. And this was continued by Trump uh, and now by Biden. And so the Australia-United Kingdom-US uh, agreement or AUKUS must be seen in this wider context, along with the quadrilateral, quadrilateral security dialogue uh, and the proposal to expend, extend NATO to the Indo-Pacific. Under AUKUS, Australia will be further militarised and turned into a US garrison. And that includes the deployment of US aircraft, new military bases, militarisation of space, cooperation in hypersonic weapons and cyber war warfare, and a lot more. And it's important for us to remind ourselves that US annual military spending is triple that of China and has been for many years. Furthermore, China is ringed by US bases, uh, which the US intends to supplement with a network of precision strike missiles. And every step that China makes to break out of this sort of military encirclement is presented in our media as more pr pr proof of its aggressive intent. Now, the military posture of China is overwhelmingly defensive and to, to designed to protect its own coastline and preserve its access to the world by the South China Sea. However, it's also possible that China may overact and take measures that lead to full-scale war. Um, and here I want to emphasize that 
notwithstanding our criticism of US policy, we are absolutely opposed to any attempt by China to achieve reunification with Taiwan by force. And I'd emphasize too that it's simply impossible to confront the existential threat posed by runaway global warming while also pouring billions into, into, a, new, into a new Cold War. Here in Australia, we've, we, are, we are on the back foot on this question because a real propaganda campaign has been whipped up um, around the so-called China threat. According to a poll conducted by the Lowy Institute in 2018, 52% of Australians believe China would act responsibly in the world. Uh, and, and only two years later, uh, that had dropped to 23%. And, that, and then a year later, it's by, down to only 16%. So an important task for us in Australia is to strengthen the anti-AUKUS coalitions and to start educating Australians about the war drive, where it comes from. Um, and in doing so, we need to turn the language of the warmongers on its head and say that we are the ones committed to uh, a future based on security, not them. They're committed to war, not security. Well, to finish up on, I want to come back to questions that were raised um, by the war in Ukraine and raised by Dennis uh, about shifts in the world capitalism, what imperialism is or is not, uh, and what's going on. On the left, there's been some debate about whether Russia is an imperialist power. Oftentimes, these debates are more frustrating than useful, I think, because people are often use different definitions of the word uh, when they're debating with each other. So let's start with the Marxist definition developed in Lenin's time. Understanding that imperialism as a world economic order in which the wealth is, is extracted from the global south uh, by virtue of the fact that productivity of labour is so much higher in the global north because that's where capital and technology are concentrated. Now, that understanding remains vital because it continues to describe the world in which we live. It's a, it's a defining, it remains a defining feature um, of, of the world in which we live, notwithstanding the discussion about a multipolar world and all that sort of thing, which I'll, which I'll come back to. And I'll just take three kind of random illustrations. First was um, the EU foreign policy chief, Josette Borrell, who, who declared only last week, quote, that Europe is a garden. Most of the rest of the world is a jungle and the jungle could invade the garden. I think that just about perfectly uh, defines the fortress Europe uh, and that, and that division, division of the world into, into the global north and global south, and the fact that that division is maintained with violence every single, every, every single day of the year. Another indicator of that is that is the absolute determined, de determination of the US to stop China from obtaining microchip technology. So not only are certain Chinese firms now banned from importing microchips, uh, uh, but both US citizens and US permanent residents are banned from working on microchip technology in China or with Chinese corporations. And thirdly, and Dennis has already mentioned this, is the 400,000 people that died in Yemen in a war that even barely rates a mention in our media. So if you look at the place of Russia, if you look at Russia's place in the world economy with a GDP smaller than South Korea, then you would say it's not an imperialist power. Even China, whose economy is very large in absolute terms, only has a labour productivity of about 25% that of the US or Western Europe. So their economies like Brazil or Mexico or Turkey uh, might be described, you know, the, the language we traditionally use in the Marxist movement is semi-peripheral. Maybe that's not a sufficient term nowadays, but that, 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 that's the, the, the term that's often been used to describe their insertion into the world economy. Nevertheless, Putin's Russia still embodies an aggressive and expansionist capitalist project that believes that the states of the so former Soviet Union and its, and its near neighbours are its so-called rightful sphere of influence. And it's, and it's just as prepared to use war to enforce that project as Western imperialism is. And we should also remind ourselves that in an earlier phase, Lenin himself used the word imperialist to describe the Russian empire. Um, despite the much weaker development of capitalism in Russia at the time. So I think on this question, it's important not to confuse semantics with substance. That economic definition of imperialism remains important, but it doesn't change that the Russian invasion is an absolutely, is absolutely catastrophic, no, ma no matter if you call Russia imperialist or not. Now, and the, the fact that many people in the global south effectively support Russia um, as a lesser evil in the current war is is in a sense understandable from a historic point of view and in terms of the development of world imperialism. But the point I want to emphasize is that it's a political dead end. 
Of course, we should be opposed to efforts by the U.S. By, opposed to efforts by the U.S. to reassert its hegemony by force. And there seems to be some contradictory outcomes from the from, from the war uh, in Ukraine at the moment. On the one hand, the, the United States seems seems to have reasserted its strategic hegemony in in, in Europe, uh, but at the other time, uh, there there seems to be a breaking up of that hegemony. Not just the consolidation of Russia, Iran, and China, but other so-called semi-peripheral powers like Turkey, India. Qatar and Saudi Arabia not taking their marching orders from the United States in the way that they had in the past. But the point I want to emphasize is that multipolarity by itself is not necessarily a step forward for left and progressive forces in the world. Right-wing nationalist authoritarian governments of the semi-periphery that are in conflict with the West over, over so-called spheres of influence while disrupting the world order are not and cannot be the spearhead of our anti-imperialist struggle. I think the deal between, or the impending deal between Putin, Erdogan and Assad at the expense of the Kurdish freedom struggle and the struggle for democracy in Syria more generally uh, bear that out. And that's a reminder that the force that is gonna make the change we need is working people. That's the force that's gonna make, make the change we need world over. Um, and that's the one we need to ally ourselves with, whether it's in Australia, Russia, um, Turkey or Ukraine. Thanks, comrades. Thanks so much, Sam and Dennis, uh, for those terrific presentations. OK, so uh, the question about the far right, um, obviously, we we have been um, as, as leftist activists who have been targeted by far right violence for uh i am i am in activism i think for uh, a decade and a half and throughout this time we were constantly uh, attacked by the far right and it's a problem in ukraine as it is throughout europe and as you rightly mentioned the russian regime has been also uh so much pushing to the this far right uh, that i i just recommend two russian leftist authors Greg Yudin and um, Ilya Budraitskis, who have uh, been elaborating on this question of the fasci fasci fascistization of, of, uh, of the Russian regime. And obviously it has been a beacon for, for many far-right movements throughout Europe and for right-wing authoritarians in the world as well. But um, the Ukrainian far-right is really, it's given very much coverage, both in um, um, like, pro-Russian narrative, but also in uh, many like pro-Ukrainian, so it's heroization, lionization of Azov, that is the most um, uh, well-known uh, group that was established by people from the far right. So now it's incorporated inside the National Guards of Ukraine, not, not into the uh, army proper, not to the armed forces, but to this uh, part of the Ministry of Interior. And they claim that uh, they control it politically. That there, there is no like political overtures. It's controlled by the ministry, and uh, all these old uh, neo-Nazi guys have gone from. But still, you you clearly know that people who come from a far-right background, um, um, uh, football hooligans, uh, and uh, people from fascist subcultures, they would prefer to join specifically this group in, in, inside the Ukrainian armed groups. Um, but at the other, at the other hand, uh, it has been, uh, it was in Mariupol. Mariupol was uh, sieged by, by Russia. And again, the, the, the uh, most prominent force there was the Marines, but everyone was speaking about, not about the Ukrainian Marines, but about the Azov uh, regiment. Uh, and still, so we can say that now it's reduced in numbers due to these objective factors, but they have this kind of, you know, media coverage and uh, some kind of uh, political capital on their side. Uh, but if we um, take a glimpse about on, on the role uh, that the far right nationalism uh, now plays in the current Ukrainian resistance and compare it, for instance, with eight years ago when Russia annexed Crimea and the uh, Mm, had instigated the, 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 the war in Donbass. So we can see that the uh, proportion of the far right is much, much less. So the far right isn't so significant. And you have people from all diverse backgrounds who have joined the resistance. And those 
uh, the far right has no um, exclusive uh, posing as uh, the primary defenders of Ukraine. So actually, you you have people from uh, from all other backgrounds, uh, Jewish, uh, Muslims like Crimean Tatars, uh, people from Roma, uh, Roma people who are uh, the most probably dispossessed and excluded in the Ukrainian society, and lots of them are now in the ranks of, of, of armed forces. So uh, I think that uh, there are two tendencies, one which is um, more bringing us to some kind of ethno-nationalist uh, vision of Ukraine, but another that is embracing this kind, uh, kind of uh, plurality inside Ukrainian and uh, multiculturality inside Ukrainian society. So, uh, and again, the dynamic since uh, Maidan uh, protests to this time, it uh, showed that uh, the far right has no uh, popular support. So uh, electoral support, it's maybe 2% on all, e all elections. And even the, uh, the last presidential elections where the former president Poroshenko was running on a national conservative platform, while uh, Zelensky had a very vague, but uh, very inclusive uh, and very you know, diverse and very anti-nationalist uh, platform. And uh, he defeated uh, the incumbent in like 75% uh, against uh, 25%. Uh, you can see that uh, the, generally this so kind of extreme right uh, views, they are uh, denounced by Ukrainian society in general. Um, about the far right in the army and how they interact with uh, leftists, uh, I, I uh, presume that uh, in the army proper, it's uh, they really try uh, not to um, not to have uh, these units organized on political lines. So usually uh, they they try not to uh, not to manifest them like politically, uh, like I mean the the, the military command. So. Uh, and still, you have the majority of people there who are apolitical, ap ap who, who aren't into this. So, uh, in majority of uh, issues, uh, there is nothing, no such thing as uh, the far right and the leftists fighting, uh, you know, alongside. They are in completely different places, and they don't interact even. And uh, I think that this this line they still uh, exist um, about them. Uh, this application for for uh, membership in uh, in NATO it was more like a sign of you know a, a, a move of despair a bit of and a, a move a move to uh, manifest that Ukraine also can take some uh, drastical measures to uh, counterweight some some Russian moves. So it was unrealistic from the beginning because we understand the, the uh, main European countries like France and Germany, they would never allow uh, Ukraine, especially Ukraine in times of conflict to, to be um, admitted to NATO. And uh, as to um, EU application, again, it's a, a very complex issue because um, when the EU association agreement was on the table and we had an analysis that showed that Economically, of, of course, it's uh, very neoliberal, uh, but as neoliberal as all Ukrainian governments are. And uh, it's not uh, good for Ukrainian industries. But uh, some political provisions and some provisions that are uh, due to you know, human rights protections and so on, they can be actually used by uh, Ukrainian uh, civil society to, um, uh, to empower somehow, because, uh, for instance, even these latest uh, anti-labor uh, laws that were adopted, um, the unions, they found some clauses in the uh, agreements with the EU that uh, have been violated by, uh, they were so extremely neoliberal that they violated even this uh, EU uh, agreement. So, um, but it's, you, you see, it's still very opportunistic. So uh, we cannot have some clear uh, one side vision. About uh, um, the issue of um, how the post-war, uh, the role of uh, progressive leftist forces in the post-war reconstruction. So again, yes, I completely agree that we have this uh, example of uh, post-Second World War when victory over fascism, it empowered peoples, uh, not just in, the, in England, but throughout Europe. 
and they uh, could gain more uh, gains more and more concessions from the ruling classes and push them to broaden their uh, social uh, and other rights. Um, and again, uh, you will have people who will, uh, in case if uh, Ukraine can uh, withstand and uh, win over in, in, in the war, so uh, the people will have this enthusiasm, but uh, you also need the people to be organized politically and uh, in unions to have these structures that can put this pressure. Because at uh, another situation, you have just the side of, of, of uh, capital, the side of big business that will have the, all, all, all the necessary structures to influence the, the um, political life. And so that's one, one of our uh, aims at even at this uh, latest our conference when we're speaking about our political uh, strategy and what uh, moves we uh, as a political group that strives to become a political party, a grassroots political party of the working class on uh, the position of democratic socialism, um, uh, uh, build these links between um, union activists, uh, activists of other progressive social movements, um, and how to, uh, because it's, they also feel that they lack this political representation, they lack a political subject that would speak for the majority of uh, Ukrainian population and of their by their uh, specific social movements. So uh, we can use uh, this empowerment of people and also the situation when lots of oligarchs, they actually, they were affected by, by the outcome of the war and uh, they, they feel, seem more vulnerable than uh, previously. So uh, it's, again, it will be uh, a result of political struggle. And so we need to prepare for it. And we are trying to do this. And uh, you also mentioned the question about this, um, uh, the political parties that were outlawed, that were first suspended, that the majority of them, they were banned by the court. So um, it was mainly against the remnants of the formerly ruling party of regions. It was the main oligarchic party and also the main uh, party linked to, to, to Russia. And um, uh, some of its successors, uh, they have been uh, banned because uh, some of their prominent members were collaborating with, with uh, the Russian occupiers. Uh, but actually, the majority of their MPs, uh, they are still in the parliament and they vote together with uh, um, the majority for these anti-labor, anti-social uh, laws. So you, you can clearly see that there is no class distinction between forces. Um, uh, but also there was a number of parties with uh, leftist names that were in this list. And uh, the majority of them were uh, non-existent at this moment. They were uh, completely virtual because they died over a long ago. Lots of them, they were not so much leftist uh, and socialist and communist as they, their name suggested. They were mostly... Um, um, bourgeois parties uh, that were very linked to different factions, again, of the uh, mostly pro-Russian factions of uh, Ukrainian capital, and uh, very opportunistic, uh, very uh, socially conservative, uh, that were not so, 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 so eager to support uh, labor rights or the struggle for socialism as uh, the struggle, uh, I don't know, to uh, reintroduce death penalty or uh, to protect the Orthodox Church and traditional values. Uh, so um, clearly, uh, but there were some parties that were at some points genuinely uh, more or less socialist, like the, uh, the, the party with the same name. But then it also uh, underwent this uh, hijacking by different political fraudsters. And uh, at some point it, it was a far right guy uh, who then become a very pro-Russian um, MP who is now in Russia calling on to uh, nuke Ukrainian cities, so completely insane. Um, but uh, actually, uh, again, uh, we as a social movement, we criticized this uh, decision to outlaw these parties because we see it notwithstanding with how bad these parties were. But this was a, a clear use of the situation of martial law, a situation of war, to uh, uh, tighten the uh, political um, 
face and to uh, what now is applied to the parties who, who are really bad and pro-Russian, it can be the same pretext applied to uh, other oppositional forces as well. So this is a, a very dangerous move on, on the side of any, uh, any government, any power. So uh, we need to oppose this and, and to suggest uh, the democratic rights and the rights to assemble, they, uh, they need to be uh, protected. Uh, but so still, still the majority of Ukrainian parties, we have like three, 300 of them, including other so-called leftist, but non-existent parties, they, they still exist, at least on paper. Okay, so, um, yeah, the question about the place of Ukraine as a peripheral uh, country. So you have uh, this Central Eastern European uh, EU members, and you again, you have a, a range of, of their positions. So some of them are more successful. I would call like the most so social democratic, probably in its model, Slovenia, that was already the uh, most well doing uh, part of Yugoslavia and also probably of the um, general region. And then on the other hand, of course, you have uh, Romania. And you have uh, also countries like uh, Hungary that is uh, economically extremely neoliberal and uh, politically increasingly uh, authoritarian um, and uh, ultra conservative. Um, so you could see that uh, again, all of them, they are still um, not at the core of, of the European Union. They are still the periphery of European Union. And uh, this also brings us to um, this uh, justified notion that um, probably Ukraine is too big for uh, EU to digest because there are like a bit of contradictory situation here. Ukraine is at, same, at the same time uh, competing with, uh, it, it was competing with Moldova for being uh, the European country with the lowest uh, wages. But at the same time, it also had remnants of a, a rather sophisticated industry and uh, still a potential for building over this high tech in uh, aerospace and uh, this, uh, this type of spheres. Um, but at the same time, it was increasingly dragged to the role of this uh, raw material supplier, mainly in agriculture and uh, metal works. So, uh, yes, and we understand that EU is not about uplifting peoples. EU is about flows of capital and uh, the interests of the capital at its core. Uh, so, uh, again, uh, we uh, may say and we say that you can use some, um, some uh, provisions that emerge in this dynamic between Ukraine and EU uh, on your own sake. But in general, uh, the general trend isn't so um, um, isn't uh, so supportive of, 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 of Ukraine, and uh, of course, uh, be it be it the European Union or be it uh, uh, some other um, competing um, economic power, um, they won't just admit you to be part of their paradise, of this Borel's uh, forest, yes, uh, garden, nice, nice garden. So, uh, so it's really about the question whether to, uh, how to do these transformations inside the country. And uh, for a long time, uh, we both in social movement and in the Commons Journal, uh, we had a number of, um, books, uh, actually, some collections of articles that were analyzing the um, status of Ukrainian economy, its growing uh, debt dependency and its uh, degradation of industries. And also, uh, even the titles of these uh, collections were like social and economic alternatives for, uh, for Ukraine. So we were thinking about how to build a completely another uh, approach uh, that will break with uh, a previous uh, peripheral capitalist uh, uh, model. Uh, but again, it needs to be uh, won over in, in a cycle of political uh, struggle. So uh, we see that the majority, if not the um, 
the entirety of Ukrainian mainstream political parties. They see no alternative to some marketization and uh, all this stuff. And the general population, when they speak about Europe, when they speak about the European Union, it's it's something like an empty signifier. So if you speak with someone from the uh, business, they will say that Europe means more deregulation, more liberalization economically. If you speak with uh, someone from the union, they will say Europe means strong unions, uh, organized labor. Uh, so you, you could see this ambiguity of this uh, um, uh, paradise that is uh, like depicted in, in, in the general um, uh, view of Europe as something uh, but, uh, very good in, in all, all, all aspects. But uh, actually, if we, um, uh, we as internationalists in, in Ukraine and in neighboring countries, because we had uh, enormous support also from, from comrades in, in Poland and in some uh, northern uh, Nordic countries, um, but also them coming from France and from the UK, we, we see that in order to challenge this system, we need to really uh, struggle for another Europe, to struggle from another Europe from below that will be socially oriented. And uh, to do this, we uh, not just need to do this internal political struggle, but we also to need the, uh, to do this uh, coordination on the international level. This applies not obviously not just to Europe. And this also applies to this notion of Ukraine as uh, Ukraine or Belarus is uh, the, the northern uh, country of the global south, that we need to build these bridges with the countries of the periphery as well. And uh, to challenge that um, models of capitalist uh, domination and power that uh, are rare produced in the global uh, capitalist world system. Uh, so the question about the um, um, Zelensky and all the, all the oligarchs. So yes, from in his run, Zelensky was supported by a number of oligarchs, primarily Igor Kolomoisky. And now Kolomoisky is said to have been stripped of his uh, Ukrainian citizenship, as he has multiple citizenships, as lots of oligarchs who not just uh, hide their uh, profits in uh, tax havens, but also they have uh, all types of passports for, for, for their sake. Um, and this was part of his distancing from his, his patron. And also you could say that uh, his first, uh, Zelensky's first prime minister was a, uh, someone favored by the transnational capital. His second prime minister, current prime minister, uh, he is, uh, he's coming from uh, Renat Akhmetov, the um, most, uh, the richest Ukrainian oligarchs uh, structures. Uh, but and at some point, uh, Zelensky was playing the same game that all Ukrainian presidents from the time when President Kuchma essentially uh, established this uh, oligarchy capitalist model, that they were triangulating between different groups of oligarchs and maintaining this oligarchic consensus. Uh, but at the same time, yes, Zelensky tried to uh, get, get out of this uh, circle and uh, to gain power on its own. But at the same time, as you mentioned, his uh, social policies were so unpopular and he was uh, merely a lame duck at, the, uh, at this, like a year ago, because people uh, expected a lot from him because he was also an empty signifier and everyone was uh, putting their own uh, expectations and no one came out. So it was a continuation of the same politics. Because if you don't change the system, you just change the, the, the guy. This may be a nicer guy, a younger guy, a more cheerful guy, but the people behind, oh, okay, they a bit were also uh, changing because it was not so much about this biggest capitalist, but more about some kind of medium bourgeoisie. So you could see even uh, in his um, political team that these are people with a very... Um, this middle middle class, uh, medium bourgeoisie uh, type of mindset and class horizons. So they weren't even thinking ab big about economy. They they didn't even grasp the uh, what what it means to have like big industries and big production lines. And thinking about oh how we can uh, boost the economy. Maybe we can legalize gambling or something like that. So it's uh, very pathetic. But then, of course, in the times of invasion, Zelensky, uh, even without much effort, he became like a figurehead, uh, um, 
as a um, commander in chief, he is associated as a person who, and yes, his first, his first addresses to the Ukrainian people in times of aggression, they helped uh, psychologically and in terms of morale to, to many people. And he comes from show business. He knows to how to do these uh, appeals. And, and, and in a way, they were also very, very humane. They, they weren't, uh, you know, dehumanizing. They were uh, something on the opposite side. They were calling on resistance, but at the same time also trying at least in first weeks to, to, to get also to the hearts of the, the Russian citizens. But um, uh, so, but in general, again, it's, uh, just about him as a figure that is associated with this uh, with the general resistance. So, if it comes to concrete steps of his ministers, uh, they are deeply unpopular, and uh, you can find lots of criticisms of people from his team uh, throughout the population. So, don't be. Uh, don't just look on this. Uh, yeah, I'm sure he has enormous uh, approval ratings now, but uh, his concrete uh, policies and the policies of his ministers, they will be very low as well. Then he may use this, and he probably is using this to um, his newly gained popularity to uh, break out more from this, uh, you know, dependence on concrete oligarchs. Uh, and it brings more to some kind, you know, more a bigger concert of smaller, smaller capitalists, but it's still inside the system. Um, about the question about the Russian speakers. Um, so um, uh, in uh, this invasion, it was a game changer for uh, millions of people, uh, including those people who used to be pro-Russian and who, um, after the invasion, they lost all their faith in, in, in Russia and everything that's associated with Russia because they were, they were eager to, uh, and many of them also voted for Zelensky because they voted for peace process. And uh, in first year of his presidency, Zelensky was doing some steps to uh, negotiate a lasting peace, but uh, Putin's uh, side wasn't, uh, was very reluctant. But it was denying any kind of agency. We are not speaking with you. We are speaking only with, with Washington and uh, Ukrainians don't exist. So this was uh, the main line of, uh, um, as a subject, as a political subject, this was the main line of, of, of uh, Putin uh, avoiding any kind of direct negotiations. And uh, this, uh, and then it, he opted for, a, uh, for an invasion for the most brutal way of, of doing things. And when you are, targeted by the Russian bombs and Russian missiles, then obviously some kind of pro-Russian um, sentiment, they also wither with, with this. So I would say that predominantly the Russian speakers in the eastern parts of Ukraine, um, I am not now speaking about those parts that have been controlled by Russia for, for eight years, but for, 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 for others that have been uh, occupied like recently. Uh, they were uh, clearly uh, rejecting the occupation, and uh, you could say this both on on the uh, in the uh, first weeks of occupation in these areas, and also on the level of the participation of the Russian-speaking population in all this war effort. So you could say that uh, really, um, because many of the most dis destroyed cities they were predominantly Russian-speaking. And they were destroyed by the same Russian army that was claiming that it comes to somehow protect the, the Russian-speaking population. And it was actually uh, like physically uh, destroyed. So, uh, but at the same time, yes, uh, there are also lots of people because essentially many people in Ukraine, they have been bilingual, both Ukrainian and Russian-speaking, and also the mixture of these languages, uh, this Creole pidgin language, Surzik. Um, so many of them, they, uh, after the invasion, they were voluntarily saying that I don't want to be associated with Russia and Russian language and Russian culture, so I, I now will use Ukrainian instead. Uh, but there are also lots of people who still stick, st stick to, to uh, their Russian language and uh, as their native, but who uh, 
both in terms of uh, political and uh, national identification say that they are you know, like Ukrainian and pro-Ukrainian. Um, and you can say that the majority of the current government, they also come from Russian-speaking backgrounds. Zelensky comes from the same city of uh, Krivoyrych and he's from assimilated um, Jewish origin uh, intelligentsia there. So um, again, uh, it's more more complex than just the Russian speaky speakers versus Ukrainian speakers. It's also different shades of uh, in between. Um, then there was this uh, extremely important intervention by uh, Rihanna. I'm very uh, grateful for, for it. Uh, and about the general question about um, uh, the national sovereignty. Um, so yes, at, at uh, one side, uh, you have like the legitimate right of um, any uh, victims of aggression to obtain uh, all weapons they need and they may obtain them from uh, nasty places as well because this was the story starting from I don't know the re uh, revolution of black Jacobins on uh, Haiti when they were at some points uh, you trying to align with uh, with the Spanish or the British to get rid of the French colonizers or the royalist French that was supporting the American Revolution. And then you can go over to the Kurds uh, that were at some point uh, supported by the US but then abandoned. And we understand that all these imperial powers that may support some uh, um, liberation movements uh, they do it not not because they are they, they feel solidarity for them, but because they they are driven by their own uh, very pragmatic interests. Um, and we need not to put any illusions. And I think that of course many people in in Ukraine now have they had lots of illusions in in, in the West, but at the same time they were also very disillusioned uh, at some points. Uh, um, but. For, 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 for another reason, for instance, they were pointing out on um, um, German big industries, businesses uh, still uh, doing business with, with Russian oil and gas companies, and that they are still fueling the war here. And they, uh, Germany and France, they actually were uh, supplying military um, hardware to Russia uh, up to the moment of, of the invasion despite some kind of embargoes and so on. And other people, they were also um, feeling that, uh, okay, um, we are now like fighting and someone, yes, may, may present us as proxies. That's of course very derogatory for, for when you speak about the, the, the people. At the same time, even if we try to analyze some bigger, um, this bigger context, then uh, I, I heard uh, a, a joke not, like recently that uh, Russia is now a proxy of Iran because uh, it's uh, showing Iran uh, the, um, poss the possibilities uh, of, of uh, Iranian uh, drones in attacking civilian uh, population. So, but yes, you see this interaction on different levels of, of different interests. But at the same time, um, the people who uh, people in Ukraine they uh, feel very bad when they are regarded as, as some kind of proxies because essentially Ukraine still fights on its own. Uh, you cannot say that uh, there is some uh, like uh, military assistance uh, direct uh, with with people from other countries. Uh, who who came here to 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 fight? It's it's about uh, generally the, the millions of Ukrainians who men and women who, who were involved in into this resistance. Uh, and so um, sometimes when people here see what uh, like this big Western uh, guys uh, try to present, they are also uh, disappointed. Uh, with um, with that, that we still still are inside this logic of uh, like big players that 
do their own politics. Uh, albeit uh, now Western powers, it says that they will not uh, conduct any uh, behind closed doors negotiations with Russia and no decisions about Ukraine without Ukraine. But uh, again, the face value of these uh, um, claims, it's again a bit uh, dubious. Uh, but in general, speaking about um, whether the Ukrainian government acts as uh, for someone's interests. So I would say that first of all, they of course act for their own class interests. And um, in some points, this national, it coincides with the interest of preserving Ukraine, of course, that coincides with the general population. At some uh, levels, it coincides with the intentions of uh, Western capital. And um, uh, I think that they will be eager to open the country more for, uh, for Western companies. Uh, and uh, to diminish the place of Ukrainian oligarchs that are still the part of the global capitalist class and they still uh, uh, prefer to reside somewhere in, in London or in Switzerland and uh, to live a luxurious life uh, somewhere in Europe. And, uh, many of them, they actually left the country just prior to the invasion and uh, they are well off now. And uh, this also... Uh, uh, instigates class hatred in, in uh, Ukrainian society when they see pictures and footages of, of these uh, rich people uh, who fled from Ukraine and who are uh, just living their luxurious life. Um, and at some points, uh, it because you, you see the, the interests of uh, Western capital and the Western powers, it also uh, not always coincide, which is which with each other. So you will have different interests of, say, Germany and UK and US. Um, but uh, the problem, one of the problems of a Ukrainian, um, mm, you, you may say that it's like uh, the comprador bourgeoisie, but uh, that uh, they are sometimes like, I would call it saying bigger Catholics than the Pope himself. So they try to be bigger enthusiasts of the West than the West itself. So uh, uh, many, many of, uh, of these people uh, here in Ukraine, they, yes, they are very people in charge. They are very eager to um, follow everything that is uh, told uh, from the West. And sometimes they, they, even, they even don't have the, the necessary commands, but they, they, they go on this line. Uh, however, still, I think that um, Ukrainian capitalism, it's... Um, it's peripheral, but it's a bit uh, different from, say, um, what's in, in Hungary and some other neighboring countries, because it's still uh, rather strong in itself. So uh, they still uh, try to uh, play a role as if they are some, some, some kind of subject, and they, they want to be a subject, and the people of Ukraine, they obviously want to be a subject. And here we come to the... Uh, this next step, then when we speak about what's going on in the real world now and uh, what kind of world we want to replace it, the kind of world well, where popular uh, sovereignty isn't something uh, um, fictional, where uh, really the people are empowered and the smaller uh, nations and smaller peoples are um, um, equal uh, parts of the international processes. And this is something that is very contrary to that um, set of thinking that is uh, behind the Russian invasion. Because if if Russia succeeds, it will be a it sets a precedent for all other imperialist uh, predators to uh, do the same, to redraw uh, orders, to invade uh, more countries. Obviously, the countries have been invaded uh, already, but. Every success for any imperialist, it instigates other imperialists. And also uh, Putin's vision of, uh, of this multipolarity, so-called, is about uh, actually dividing the world to spheres of influence of several uh, actual players. So US, maybe, maybe EU, China, maybe India, maybe Brazil. So that's all. 
and all other uh, countries, all other peoples, they are denied any kind of agency. So uh, they are seen merely as uh, objects, uh, not as subjects as, uh, of international politics. And uh, this is some return to some old school empires of the 19th century. Uh, and uh, this is something that goes very contrary to the uh, best interests of, uh, of people, of uh, peoples of, of global south, uh, because this is something that reintroduces uh, not just the existing neo-colonialist and neo-imperialist uh, struggles of US, China, and all other players, but that enshrines this type of uh, subjugation and hierarchy that you have the big uh, sovereign uh, countries and the others that, are, that aren't even real countries. And this was Putin's message about Ukraine. And this is his message about the countries throughout the world. So it's uh, quite important for us as the international leftist movement to um, produce some counter narrative to uh, think about how we can rebuild the world order to build to be more egalitarian, to be from below, and to be not about uh, how to to really work on on actual demilitarization, denuclearization, uh, and uh, of the world and of stripping those uh, big pub, big powers of of, of their uh, tools. Uh, so this can be done possibly. Uh, by solidarity from below with peoples uh, throughout the world, not not this fake, uh, you know, uh, governmental um, friendship and our great friend Boris Johnson that have, we have been presented for a long time, but for an actual, and we've already seen actual solidarity from the people who were helping all Ukrainian refugees in, in, in other countries. And this should be also applied to other people fleeing from other countries, from other conflicts, from, from other problems that have been uh, treated so, uh, so terribly in, in Europe, in, in, in the US and in all these parts of the uh, global north. So again, this, this is, I think, a common struggle and we need to, uh, to engage more, including uh, with, with you. Thank you so much. 